still resting right away? Yes. Yes, we plan on resting in New Jersey from here officially. Please be seated. Mr. Perry, do you have any additional evidence you wish to present? Yes, at this time, the defense will rest. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the defense has rested its presentation of evidence. Mr. Bashi, do you have any rebuttal evidence? Yes, sir. State calls Dr. Robert Denny. Yes, sir. <coughs> Dr. Denny, come on up. Have a seat. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now can be for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be back. Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you state your name for the record and spell your last name for the court report? Robert L. Denny, last name D E N N E Y. How are you employed? I am a uh, private practitioner in the area of clinical psychology. Can you explain for us a little bit what psychology is? Well, psychology is actually quite broad uh, and can include anything from running rats in mazes to, to uh, studying human behavior. Clinical psychology is focused more on human behavior and how to measure that and how to hopefully improve that for people. Do you practice in any other specific areas of psychology? Yes, I practice in two different specialty areas. One is forensic psychology, and the other is clinical neuropsychology. Could you tell us a little bit about what clinical neuropsychology is? Clinical neuropsychology is the study of brain behavior relationships. So a clinical psychologist or a clinical neuropsychologist is a clinical psychologist that has advanced training in the brain from neuroanatomy, neuropathology, how the brain functions, and how to measure the brain and uh, evaluate people with brain abnormalities and things like that. And what about forensic psychology? Forensic psychology is generally a clinical psychologist who has some specialized training in the area of the application of that clinical psychology principles to areas of the law, which could include civil law, personal injury maybe, or, or uh, other forms of law, criminal law, of course, as well. Number two, what I've marked is page 187. Do you recognize state's exhibit 187? Yes, I do. What is it? That's my CV. What is a CV, just Cur briefly? Curriculum vitae. It's a resume. Fancy word for a resume. <laughs> How many pages is your resume? 22, I believe. You moved to Met State's Exhibit 187. No objection, Judge. You received without objection. Are you licensed as a psychologist? Yes, I am. Where? I have a license to practice psychology in Missouri. I also have a, a license to practice in the District of Columbia, that's Washington, D.C., and then I have a temporary license to practice in the state of Alaska. Do you hold any board certifications? Yes, I do. Good. What are they? Two different board certifications. Number one, I'm board certified in forensic psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology and have been since 1997. The other board certification is in the area of clinical neuropsychology, also by the Board of American, American Board of Professional Psychology. And I've been board certified in neuropsychology since 2003. How is being board certified different than being licensed? Well, a license gives you permission to practice. It means you have the adequate amount of knowledge and skill to do the practice. Board certification is a level beyond that where you've actually put your own skills, your own work product, into the hands of other experts in the field where they review it and evaluate not only your credentials, your training, but also your actual work samples. And then they also interview you for a three-hour long panel interview uh, 
uh, regarding your understanding, your skills, your knowledge base, your your thinking in regard to diagnostics and application of the psychological tests to the case, things like that, as well as treatment issues. And so board certification validates or verifies your advanced skill in that specialty area in the eyes of other experts in the field. How many people are board certified in both clinical neuropsychology and forensic psychology? I believe there are eight. Including yourself? Including myself. Have you had an opportunity to testify as an expert before? Yes, I have. On how many cases? Well over 100. I, I've lost count. Once I hit 100, I stopped counting. Would you tell the jury a little bit about your educational background? Yes. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in youth ministry and biblical studies from the Lutheran Bible Institute in Seattle. And then I uh, changed my track a little bit and obtained a master's degree in psychology from the Forest Institute of Professional Psychology and then ultimately obtained a doctor of psychology also from the Forest Institute of Professional Psychology and I obtained that in 1991. With regard to your master's degree, did you graduate with any honors? Uh, magna cum laude, I believe. What's that mean? It's a fancy Latin phrase meaning you got a pretty good grade point. What about your doctor of psychology? Same with that. Did you serve an internship of some kind? I did. As part of my doctoral degree, one of the requirements was a year-long full-time practice setting under supervision of licensed psychologists. And that internship for me from 1990 to 1991 was at the United States Medical Center for Federal Prisoners. Here in Springfield? Yes, in Springfield. And during that internship, was there a forensic rotation? Yes, there were several rotations. There was an inpatient psychiatric treatment rotation, which was major. There was also a major rotation in forensic assessment. That's where we learned how to perform forensic psychological evaluations for the U.S. District Courts under the supervision of a licensed or board-certified forensic psychologist. Then I also had rotations in medical surgical parts of the hospital and uh, substance abuse. A part of that internship also included outplacement for me one day a week at the Missouri uh, Rehabilitation Center in Mount Vernon. It was a head injury rehabilitation hospital. And then I also uh, had part of the year one day a week at Cox North, uh, an adolescent substance abuse treatment program. Have you had the opportunity to teach in the area of criminal forensic psychology? Yes, I have. And have you served as a director of any psychology, psychology education program? Yes, I was, I was a professor at the Forest Institute, which is a graduate program in clinical psychology. And I was the director of the forensic program there for uh, a number of years just a small number, maybe three or four. Have you served on the editorial board of any peer-reviewed journals? Yes, I have, and I do. What does it mean when a journal or an article is peer-reviewed? Well, the way the system works is uh, researchers, authors, do the research, and they write up the papers, and then they submit it to a scientific journal. The editor looks at that paper and decides whether it's appropriate for the journal, and whether it appears to advance our knowledge in the science. And if they think it's good, then they send it to uh, the editorial board. And the editorial board are people scattered all around the world who are experts in the field in that area. And those individuals then review the research and critique it, okay? identifying whether the method's appropriate, the subjects are appropriate, are the conclusions and results appropriate, does that all make sense? and, our, and uh, does it fit with our understanding of science. And then they rate the paper, and so peer-reviewed journals that have peer-reviewed papers, uh, simply they have editorial boards that review the submissions and determine whether it's good science or not. And once it's approved by the editorial board, then it can be published. Have you published papers in the area of forensic psychology? Yes, I Have you published a paper with regard to autism? Yes, I am. 
want to talk a little bit about your work history after you left that internship with the Bureau of Prisons. What did you do after that? Well, actually, they hired me immediately at the end of my internship. I left on Friday as an intern, came back on Monday as a staff psychologist. And the role they uh, wanted to put me in was as a forensic psychologist, uh, which I couldn't do exactly until I was licensed. I mean, you have to be licensed. Um, but in the federal system, you can be licensed in any state in the union. And so I took the examination right away and became licensed in Arizona. So for the first couple of months, I was practicing in the medical surgical side of the hospital. But then come January of 1992, I rotated over to do forensic studies, which I did full time there for eight years. Could you just briefly describe how it's different to work in the forensic unit as opposed to the medical surgical area? Yes. Let me, if I may, sure. uh, first of all, explain the U.S. Medical Center. We all know it's here, but not everybody understands what happens there. It's about a 1,100 bed medical surgical psych hospital for. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons male inmate population. And in that hospital, there's medical and surgical units, right? Uh, sentenced inmates who may be somewhere in the country that need medical care, they'll be sent here to Springfield to receive that medical care. There's also psychiatric treatment units there. And so, same thing for sentenced inmates that need psychiatric care, inpatient psychiatric care. They're referred to Springfield for that inpatient psychiatric care. The medical center also has a forensic evaluation unit. And this unit is a uh, smaller unit of uh, generally pretrial detainees. Uh, and the U.S. district courts from around the country and U.S. territories, if they have a defendant where there's mental health concerns or concerns about competency, dangerousness, what have you, uh, sanity, various things that would be relevant for the case, the judge often sends them to the Federal Bureau of Prisons for an evaluation uh, to answer specific questions. And so the evaluations that we, we did at the medical center were court referrals where we answered those types of questions, competency, stand trial, mental state at the time of the offense, risk of future dangerousness, need for inpatient mental health, hospitalization, things like that. How long did you work for the Bureau of Prisons? I worked for the Bureau of Prisons, including my internship, 21 years. And did you retire from the Bureau of Prisons? I did, at the end of 2011. Did you prepare any sort of manuals for the Bureau of Prisons? Yes, I was one of four psychologists in the Bureau of Prisons chosen to develop the forensic training manual. The uh, Bureau of Prisons has multiple medical centers around the country, but they also have numerous other facilities, and many of those other facilities have forensic psychologists that do court studies. They're called satellite centers. And they wanted us to create a manual that could be then used for training new employees, new hires, for the satellite centers on how to perform forensic evaluations. And also to then create some sense of uniformity in the way that the methods of how that evaluation is done. And so briefly, what have you been doing since you retired in 2011? Well, um, things have shifted a little bit here and there. Um, Prior to me retiring, I was actually teaching at the Force Institute. So that continued after my retirement. And then I started uh, in a private practice office in Springfield, Neuropsychological Associates. And I was working there until, uh, well, working there, doing my private consulting through that office. Then the Force Institute closed its doors. And so I switched my practice one of my one of my arms of practice, as we say, one of my settings, over to Citizens Memorial Hospital in Baltimore, and I so I work there in the neurology office and the Missouri Memory Center, where I evaluate uh, issues of possible dementia and neurocognitive impairment in adults. And then I continue with my private consulting, although it's not through Neuropsych Associates. I realized I didn't necessarily need to have an office like that because my my forensic neuropsychology consulting is throughout the country. Uh, I have cases in Alaska, Washington, D.C., Central Illinois, Texas, Indiana. 
Your Honor, at this time I request that Dr. Denny be allowed to testify in the area of forensic psychology and neuropsychology. No objection. No objection. In your work over the past couple decades, have you had an occasion to examine criminal defendants for the purpose of determining the effect of mental diseases upon their ability to have the state of mind required to be guilty of a crime? Yes, I have. Can you tell the jury a little bit about that process, how you go about doing that? That's a very good question because it's not necessarily intuitive. Because what you're trying to do is figure out a mental state that was in the past, in the past, right? So you can evaluate somebody now, but that doesn't necessarily answer what was going on back at a period in time. We call that a retrospective evaluation. So like for sanity or a mental state at the time of the crime, you have to incorporate additional information that you wouldn't normally do in a regular clinical examination. And I don't know how much detail you want me to get into. Let me ask you this. So do you break up the areas you look at in a certain domain? Well, that's a really good way to look at it, is to use a model. Rather than just zooming in there and evaluating somebody and trying to come up with some opinion, use a step-by-step methodical model as to how you gather information and connect it together. And so using this model, we've got information we learn that is contemporaneous, like right now, today, present time. So I would interview the person. So I'd get information from the person about their current mental status. I would also perform other tests and figure out other contemporary things, what's all going on for this person right now. And those two things will then guide me to a pretty good understanding of what the person's current mental status is. So that's like one row across. But we have another row here in the middle that's mental state at the time of the alleged offense or whatever it is you're looking at in the past. And you have to obviously interview the person, ask them about their mental state at the time. But you also have to review collateral information, investigative reports, information, other people that were present at the time maybe that saw the behavior of the person. And you analyze what that behavior looks like. And then knowing that self-report and the other information, the objective information, what actually happened, and combining those two together can lead you to a clinical decision about what their mental state was like at that time. I'm sorry, I'll try to slow down. Then there's another row that is historical. You talk to the person about their history, how they grew up, what sort of issues were in their life, if they had mental health conditions or issues or problems before. But then you also look at the collateral information there too. What do the records show? What do the past hospitalizations show? When mental illness or mental problems manifested themselves in their history, what did they look like? And so then combining these two together gives you a pretty good idea over here of what the person's health condition was like historically. So now we have three different rows, and we've got self-report here. We've got objective outside information that might include investigative materials or behavioral observations at past times, things like that, other people observing the person. And then we've got my clinical conclusions. Once you've got all nine of these boxes filled in, then you can combine these two together and figure out what a mental state was like at the time of the offense, and then you can answer the question that the court poses, whether it's insanity or whatever the question is, a retrospective competency or something. Does that make sense? So you have to combine each of these areas together, and then that guides you into a well-informed, reasonable conclusion about the mental state in the past. Have you been published with regard to that model you just described? Yes, I first published that model in 2000, and it's been published again in the mid-2000s, 2012, 2016. Have you had the opportunity to examine the defendant, Nicholas Fitterjohn? Yes, I have. Before we talk about your examination, can you tell the jury a little bit about 
the materials that you reviewed before doing that, or as part of that process? Uh, I can if I look at my notes, because I wrote a report that lists all those things. There were way too many things for me to remember. Let me just want. ask you about some things in general. You don't really want me to go through it. Thank you. Uh, did you re review the charges in this case? Yes, I did. And the probable cause statement? Of course. And did you review um, the Green County Sheriff's Office case summary? Yes, I did. In timeline? Yes. In the interview of the... Check out the check and clean on this. Yes. Are leaving a little bit, but it may expedite on. They're really not substantive questions about what you reviewed. Did you review interviews of people associated with the case? Yes, I did. I interviewed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different individuals, or I read reports of interviews of seven different individuals with the Green County Sheriff's Office. Did you review some surveillance videos of the defendant? Yes, there were one, two, three, three surveillance videos that were Green County related, but then there were also videos from uh, Wisconsin that I reviewed as well. Did you review uh, Facebook messages between the defendant and Gypsy Blanchard? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Between the defendant and Allie Noble, Beth Destris, Aurora Jones, and Caitlin Lee? Yes, I did. Did you review uh, the defendant's medical records and disability reports and the other materials reviewed by Dr. Franks? Yes, I did. Did you have an opportunity to review Dr. Franks' report? Yes, I did, and his raw data as well. What do you mean by raw data? Raw data is the actual, um, like when we administer psychological testing, there's actual a protocol or a, or a paper that goes with that where we write down answers and we write down scorings and things like that and then total those numbers and come to conclusions from that. I reviewed that data as well. I want to talk a little bit about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, or DSM. Can you explain briefly what that is? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is a publication by the American Psychiatric Association. It is our diagnostic manual. It helps us um, classify different conditions. It's got the diagnostic criteria, what is a condition, what isn't the condition, uh, whether there are uh, severities in that condition, if there's multiple conditions that come together and create another condition. All of that's spelled out in the diagnostic manual and it's sort of like our, our Bible as far as diagnosis. With regard to autism spectrum disorder, is that a mental disease in the DSM? Yes, it is. And can you tell us a little bit about what autism spectrum disorder is in general? Well, autism spectrum disorder is a really a concept that a person has impaired interactions with the environment, socially mostly. Um, and within that umbrella, there's different characteristics that have changed a little bit over time based upon, uh, changed in the sense that the, the, the classification of them has changed. But it's, uh, the condition itself, as I think you've heard, is the, um, a, a difficulty in social interaction that causes problems. You know, difficulty interacting with other people and normally in a social way, but also a tendency towards repetitive, focused type of behaviors that become uh, problematic. Uh, and then there's some other subcategories that other things you have to rule out. But basically those two features um, to uh, identify something within the autism spectrum disorders and then there's sub-classifications that, depending on 
other characteristics of the individual or other characteristics of the individual when they were a child, like up through three years of age, and how they behaved and how they learned that would change that diagnosis a little bit. And they would all fall under the umbrella of autism spectrum. And it's a concept, if I may, that um, varies from very severe to very, very mild, and even to where it's so mild it's not necessarily considered a, quote, disorder, end quote, right? It's characteristics of a personality style. But we don't concern ourselves with those characteristics out here because they don't really cause significant problems in social or occupational function, right? So it's, by definition, not really a disorder. But there are people with those characteristics that are not considered autism spectrum disorder. And then, of course, then there's the very extreme. Can you, so it's a little hard to picture, but can you help us picture what those ends of that spectrum look like? Yes, well, let's zoom to the severe side of it, first of all, where you've got severe autism. Um, these will often, you know, we'll think of as like children who, uh, if anybody tries to touch them or console them or uh, love on them, you know, be care for them. They'll scream, they'll bite, they'll kick, they'll bang their head, they'll react to the stimuli of somebody trying to engage them socially. And when you back off and leave them alone, they settle down. And it can be so severe that they self-harm, they'll bite chunks of flesh out of themselves, they'll bang their head, and tremendously maladaptive in the severest form. On the other extent of this uh, autism spectrum are characteristics that aren't pathological, but they're odd. Okay? When we think of an absent-minded professor or the person who has awkward social interaction skills, but otherwise they're functioning well, they have some relationships that are good, and they're able to maintain a vocation, maybe a, maybe a stellar career. And so we just think of them as odd kind. And then, then it's somewhere here there's a line between, well, now it's impacting their social or functioning, causing impairments, causing some job problems, things like that. So now it's probably a disorder, okay? But it's very mild. Okay? And then there's more moderate, and then there's severe. Does that make sense? So it's a very broad spectrum, it sounds like. How many different levels of classification are there officially? Well, officially based upon DSM, there's three. There's some research classifications that make that broader, and some of our research research tools, you know, start measuring people in the in the non-impaired ranges, right, for those characteristics. But for the diagnostic and statistical manual, there's three basic levels. And historically, there was some. We've already heard there was something called Asperger's syndrome. Yes. Um, so if I was previously diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, I've had this change in the manual, am I, do I no longer, is my condition somehow different? Your condition is exactly the same. Okay. The change in the nomenclature, just because we went from diagnostic and statistical manual number four up to number five, didn't change the condition at all. It just changed the way it's labeled. And so Asperger's being a very mild form of autism, it used to be a separate diagnosis because the characteristics are uniquely enough different than regular autism. But then in 2013, they came out with a new manual. They said, well, we're going to lump all these together under autism spectrum disorders, and we'll call them all autism, and we'll level them, level 1, level 2, and level 3. So Asperger's is subsumed under the title autism, but it would be level 1. And I know we're jumping ahead a little bit, but based on your review of the defendant's records, uh, do you agree with his historical di diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome? Yes, I do. And can you explain why that is? Well, yes, I can. And to be fair, if we we can't just say that because his history started out with autism when he was younger. Uh, because one of the things that would classify a condition as autism um, for young children is not only the communication problem and the perseverative kind of rote behaviors, you know, collecting things, 
playing with things in an odd way, repetitive behaviors, but also delay in uh, language functioning or, or general cognitive function. If the person had those delays as well, then it would be considered autism. If they did not have the language delays or overwhelming cognitive delays, then it was considered Asperger's. Okay, so that's the key difference there. And back then, when uh, Mr. Dragojian was very young, he there were indications of delayed language functioning at young ages. And so he was diagnosed with autism. <coughs> Then once he reached high school, those areas caught up, so they were no longer relevant uh, to his condition per se, and they fell away, which then changed the classification over to Asperger's, right? changed the diagnosis to Asperger's. Right? And we don't know exactly why there was that delay there. It could have been a delay, that he, but either way, he caught up, and so it was Asperger's. And I agree with that diagnosis at the time. I think it was correct. Just to talk a little bit more about his history. Uh, what was his history with regard to vocational rehabilitation? Well, um, while he was in high school, he was in a program that included um, job placement. Okay, and uh, so he'd be in classes, but then he would leave classes and go to work somewhere as a helper, or doing some sort of work type of behavior in a cafe or something like that. And uh, he did that some. And then after he finished with high school, he was involved with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation to uh, at least uh, get enrolled there and have them uh, facilitate a program of, of vocation for him. In between those events, he also worked at the pizza place uh, for a while. Or, who was waiting to sign up. And was he approved for a program of schooling with the D Division of Vocational Rehabilitation? My recollection of reviewing those records is yes, he was. He wanted to get into computer IT things, uh, computer science, uh, and they were really pushing him more into the culinary arts, kitchens and things like that. And, uh, and he finally said, yes, well, I'll do that. Uh, and then in the time it took before the program actually started, he then called him and said, no, nah, I'm not going to. So we've talked about his uh, history a little bit, and we've heard a little bit about his history. I'd like to talk now about his, the present that you mentioned. Um, did you have an opportunity to examine it? I did. Can you talk to the jury about that process in general and what that examination consists of? Sure. I examined him over three settings, January 25, 26, and February 2nd of 2017. Um, and uh, it was a thorough evaluation that included about four hours of interviewing him face-to-face -face in private, and then about 11 hours of testing over those three days. Can you describe your interaction with the defendant in general? Yes. Um, he was alert and oriented and in no acute distress. He was not upset or frustrated. Uh, he was uh, reasonably pleasant. At first, he was reserved and rather cool toward me. Uh, as, we, as the interview progressed over a number of hours and then over a couple of days, he became more jovial and, and more relaxed in his interaction with me. I would say his affect was jovial, that is his moody sort of presentation. Uh, it, was, it was reasonably friendly. Uh, he had better eye contact with me than I thought he was going to. Uh, it did not seem particularly abnormal. I mean, he would look at me and he would look down and we would talk and he would look at me. You know, it's unusual to stare at somebody, right? It's also unusual to never look at him. Um, his eye contact was actually pretty reasonable. Well, better as better as the time went on than it was up front. You've seen the days in surveillance videos at the counter there. Yes, I am. Uh, I contact similar that he makes to the clerk there. Yes, he made it, my when I was reviewing that. It looked like he made reasonable eye contact, as best you can tell from that angle. 
but also the social dynamic between the two. The, the woman behind the counter and he were both chuckling at the same issues, whether it be his bottle of root beer or whether his hair, you know, whatever. It was they were chuckled together. What were your observations about the Greyhound bus station surveillance video? The thing that I thought was interesting about the Greyhound bus surveillance video. Um, or a couple things actually. There was the one where he came up to the counter to get the ticket initially. And the plan was, you know, he's already had a ticket for return, they just needed to add another seat. Uh, and he was at the counter, and the person uh, presumably tells him, well, there's no more seats. Okay, so we gotta do something different. Uh, and then he gets cash back, and they change this, and he purchases another ticket. What's striking to me is that he did not blow up, he did not react angry, frustrated, or um, like, which is what something that, that, that would be very common with somebody with, this, with autism who would have a problem with change, especially last minute and in a potentially stressful environment. Uh, and he didn't do that. He responded to that flexibly, I thought. Uh, the other thing that was striking to me was the other scene where they're waiting in a line to go up to ticket person to check the tickets and ID or whatever, and then points, points them to go get on the bus. They waited in this line of people, I don't remember how many it was, but it had to be 15, 20, maybe more people in this line. And you could watch them working their way up patiently. They didn't react negatively to that. They waited patiently, got up to the got front, processed the tickets, and then went on. I thought that was striking too, that he didn't have a negative reaction of being surrounded by people in that line. Did he exhibit uh, social behaviors in that video at Greyhound that you saw between him and Gypsy? That's true. Uh, he, because um, you could see where they got in and out of the cab and would walk in and walk the other way. He would hold the door for her. When they walked by on the sidewalk, he was leading, she was following. Um, it, it looked very normal. You had the opportunity to watch the interview that defendant with Detective Maholan? Yes, I did. Any observations about his eye contact with her? From the way I looked at him, I mean, what it appeared to me is that he had reasonable eye contact given the stressful environment, the stressful situation. I, I didn't see that as being particularly abnormal. So. I'd like to talk about the testing you did, so. Yes. Uh, why do you engage in psychological testing? Well, it's one of the boxes, right? <laughs> this is the easy answer. It's another box. The, it's, it's, it's more objective. Right? I can talk with somebody and say, wow, this person seems really, really sharp, or this person doesn't seem quite as sharp as they should be. That's my own ten internal sense of where things lie. If I give objective psychological testing, then I can see how the person performs and I can compare those scores to norms of the population. I can say, okay, not only do I feel like this person is functioning at this level, but these tests can identify strengths and weaknesses relative to the normal population in other areas that are much finer and more detailed than I can pick up just talking with or doing some, uh, some non-formal sort of procedures with them. So I used structured objective tests. Plus, the objective key there is they're objective. They're not going to be biased so much by my own sense of what I think I want to see in the data. The data are what the data are. How do you choose what tests to get? Well, I knew, with Mr. Rodejohn specifically, I knew that um, there was a record um, with the presumed conclusion that he had some condition inside the autism spectrum. And so uh, I went in thinking that might very well be the case. And if that's the case, it's important to identify what cognitive strengths the person has and cognitive weaknesses the person has. Because there are differences. Just because you have this label, umbrella label, doesn't mean they're all the same. Everybody's different. And I wanted to measure uh, is focused attention, concentration, speed of mental processing. I wanted to measure his learning and memory, how well he learns new things verbally, how well he learns things visually. 
And then I also wanted to measure his executive function, that is his problem solving, mental flexibility, abstract reasoning, both verbal and nonverbal. And I, I wanted to measure some academic functioning, like reading, writing, arithmetic. And of course, I wanted to include tests that would give me IQ scores uh, as well. Let's talk about IQ testing a little bit, if you would. If I just sort of get that full-scale IQ score, and that's the be-all, end-all of what your intellectual functioning is, or does it work somehow differently than that? It can be the end-all, be-all in some cases, um, although that's probably short-sighted to consider it that way, because. As you know, somebody with a very high IQ may have a stellar functional life and do brilliant things. Or somebody with a very high IQ may still be making coffee at Starbucks. There's more to it than just an IQ number. Um, but that IQ number can be a good summary of a person's overall cognitive function if each of the areas inside that basket of cognition attention, concentration, learning, memory, abstract reasoning, all those things, are all relatively uniform, okay? Because the IQ score is like an average in a way. It combines all of this together into one summary indicator. But if you've got big differences inside the basket between real good strengths and really, really poor strengths, poor strengths, poor weaknesses, then one summary indicator is not a very good summary of that person. And so you have to look at the strengths and weaknesses. And there's some rules that will guide us as to what makes a good summary indicator and what does not. Is it unusual for someone on the autism spectrum to have that difference in the different parts of the IQ test? Actually, that's, that's very, very common. There's, there's, uh, there's repeated research that demonstrates that individuals in the autism spectrum have striking strengths and weaknesses, and oftentimes they fall in the same patterns, which is what we would expect. For example, with Asperger's, a mild form of autism, the difficulties are in language function, right? Um, general, or, or actually, the, the difficulty is not in language function so much. In autism, the language is delayed, right? In classic autism. In the Asperger's mild form of it, their language is strong, it's their nonverbal interaction and the nonverbal problem solving that tends to be worse. And that comes across in the IQ test, where you'll see a very strong language index, uh, like a verbal comprehension index, and a very weak uh, speed of mental processing, for example, where it measures how, brain, how fast the brain processes information. It's such a common pattern that there's research, like even in 2016, uh, in the Journal of Autism and uh, Neurodevelopmental uh, uh, Disabilities, where it says you should look at the indexes in IQ testing with people with autism spectrum because you're going to see this split. That's the way it comes out, and you should not you should not rely on the, the uh, overall IQ summary because it's not a good indicator of their genuine intelligence because they'll be very slow in speed of mental processing, because almost all of them are. That's just a common deficit. We heard a little bit about where someone would file in terms of percentiles based on these tests. Um, is there something that would be helpful to you to kind of demonstrate to the jury um, where these scores fall against norms in our... Yes, actually, because I've heard quite a bit of talk about percentiles, and percentiles are different than percent correct. It's very different, and people oftentimes get confused with the nature of percentiles. And so it's all based upon a bell-shaped curve. Okay? IQ is a bell-shaped curve. Uh, our other cognitive functions, like concentration, learning, and memory, are all bell-shaped curve. And so we can see what it looks like to be in the normal range and, and what's in the abnormally high range and the abnormally low range. Let me show you what I've marked this case exhibit 184. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Is that something you think that would assist you um, in explaining this to the jury? Yes. In, I, I, in general, what is it? It's the bell-shaped curve with the IQ scores placed on there. Move to admit to exhibit 184 as a demonstrative exhibit. No objection. Could we receive?
So if you would just briefly explain what we're looking at and how it relates to IP school. Let me pull that up. Judge Mahee's got to ask you some Thank you. I have a point, sir, Okay. I don't know how many of those. Okay, so this is the bell-shaped curve. And uh, the way this works, the, these are IQ scores along the bottom. Okay. And the height of the curve is, as you see, frequency in the population. These are norms. Okay, it's the normal population. It's the average population. It's the typical population, right, for IQ. And this is the way it comes out year after year. Uh, what we have is uh, with IQ scores, we all know an IQ of 100 is average, right? That's the average. Well, this is what it means. It's the average. It's the most common score. And, and all of the scores cluster around that score, okay? And so then we... Um, the professionals have looked at this and said, okay, well, let's, let's try to define what, uh, what is average, what is above average, and what is below average, okay? And they basically said, we're going to classify in broad terms uh, averages within one standard deviation. Okay, without boring you too much, a standard deviation basically is the average difference from the mean, okay? It's like average of the differences. And so one standard deviation with an IQ test in this direction going higher on the scale is up to 115, okay? Well, one standard deviation going lower than the, the mean of 100 is 85 because the mean, the standard deviation in an IQ test is 15. Does that make sense? So within this band of one um, standard deviation, we have 68% of the population falls in that range. In other words, for IQs, 68% of the general population, their IQ falls within one standard deviation, either above or below it. That's called average. Okay? Now, the classifications get sliced up a little bit different here and there. And I'm on a panel, actually, that was uh, seated. There's not a question. I'm sorry. If the prosecutor wants to ask a question, I would ask that we do so. But just to let me talk. Ask him to orient us to the chart, which I think he's doing, but I think we're oriented. Okay. So, for example, we heard something about, like, if I were in the 16th percentile, sounds really low if I'm thinking in terms of 90A, 80B, 70C, right? Where would I be on the bell curve if I were at the 16th percentile? The 16th percentile is right here at 85. Uh, because from 9, uh, well, from 100 down to 85, one standard deviation, there's actually 34% of the population falls in this range and 34% from 50%, which is 50% here, right? 50% of the population below, 50% of the population above. That brings you down to this line right here, and this is the 16th percentile. Uh, so if you notice, 14% fall here, 2% fall here, and a little bitty a fraction falls there, and so basically 16% falls down here. So if I had a score that was at the 16th percentile, my score falls right here. I'm, if we're talking IQ, I'm as bright as 16% of the population, or, or, or as bright or brighter than 16% of the population. But there's more that, are, that is brighter than I am, but it's still considered average. It'd be considered low average. What do you consider scores in the blue area to the left? Right here. Okay. Uh, these are what would be called, well, see, here's where I was starting to say it depends on the classification system. Uh, basically, this is, um, with IQ scores, typically they, they call, and I'm sorry, it gets confusing. I'm going to get, he was asked what it was. He's now talking about something else. I would ask the witness to answer the question the prosecutor asked him, not what he wanted to talk about. So, so stick. You can inform the question. Would you explain what the blue area means? Yes. The classification for this area includes uh, below average and borderline classifications. 
tell us what you mean by that. How are those two things different, below average and borderline? Well, some classifications overlap on this line, and they call it below average. This area here, they classically call borderline. It's not truly impaired, but it's well below typical. And where would something consistent with the intellectual disability fall? Intellectual disability, or what was formerly known as mental retardation, classically an IQ of 70 or below, although there's some flexibility around that. You had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Frank's testimony, correct? Yes, I did. You might go ahead and... Um, did you identify any issues with his analysis of the IQ score? He relied on the full-scale IQ summary indicator when he really should not have. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. There's clear guidance that when we interpret IQ testing that we look at the amount of scatter in the indexes underneath the test, the verbal comprehension index, perceptual reasoning index, working memory, processing speed, things like that. And if there's too much deviation, too much variability in those scores, then this is not a good summary indicator. There's another summary indicator you should use instead, which gives us a better overall assessment of what this person's intellectual ability is. And what is that measure? The general ability index. Can you explain what that is? Yes. It's, um, it's a measure of intelligence, but without the speed of mental processing, or what's called working memory um, in it. And so it gives you a more robust picture of the balance between um, visual thinking skills and verbal thinking skills. And it combines those two without the effect of the very slow processing speed. And it gives you a better sense of what the IQ would, should be but for that very slow processing speed. Did you rescore Dr. Frank's scoring on the IQ test? Yes, I did. Did you find any errors? I did. Did you and did you arrive at a different um, composite score set? Yes, there were multiple errors in his scoring that changed the IQ scores, the, the indices scores a little bit. Um, his original, you want, it basically changed the um, verbal comprehension index, raised it from a 96 to a 100, and then it changed the full scale IQ from an 82 to an 84. It didn't change the descriptive nature of those measures, though, did it? No, 82 and 84 are both in the low average range and 96 and 100 are both in the average range there by 100. And where, what range is his perceptual reasoning index following? His perceptual reasoning index uh, was 90, and the score changes I did didn't change that number, so it was still 90, which is right up there in the average range. And. When you computed his general ability index based on Dr. Frank's scoring, what, what did that show you? The general ability index was a 95, right beneath 100 in the average range. So what does that mean to us? That means if you don't consider the speed of mental processing, which is affected by mo motor speed, and you just think about what the person's conceptual intelligence is like, problem solving, planning, organizing, understanding the world, word definitions, things like that. If you just look at that, that score tells us what his general thinking skills are like, not including the slow motor speed. And with that general ability index of 95, it falls in the apart. Yes, it falls in the average range. 
You also administered an IQ test? Yes, I did. The same test? Yes, I did. And did you obtain some different scores? Yes, the scores I obtained were statistically significantly lower than the scores obtained by Dr. Franks. What do you mean by that? Well, I have to say statistically significantly different because these scores are not perfect, right? There's error in them. All of our tests have error, but we know what that error is, and we know how often a score, let's say, let's say we obtained a, 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 a general ability index of 95. Okay, our score is 95, but what's the true score that nobody really knows, okay? Well, it's somewhere around 95, and we can statistically identify how how accurate this 95 is. Okay, so there's, my bottom line is, there, is it, it, they fluctuate a little bit because of error. Well, I had to know whether the difference between Dr. Frank's testing and my lower scores when I tested him were just because of chance error, because the scores fluctuate a little bit. And so I ran the uh, publisher's scoring program to identify whether those scores were just a part of random variation or whether they were statistically significantly different. And they were statistically significantly different. Lower than they should have been, given Dr. Frank's testing. So did you go back and try to determine what might account for that in the testing? I did. I went back and looked at the items that, um, that he that were different between Dr. Frank's testing and my, my testing. I mean, the item was the same, but his answers were different. Like on some some questions, he he knew the right answer when Dr. Frank's asked him that question, but when I asked him that very same question um, later, he said he didn't know the answer. And so that caused him to have a lower score. And, for example, one of them would have been something like, you know, this is not an actual item, but it's something just like one of the items. Um, what's the name of the royalty in France that lost her head in her when I, revolution? Right. Well, that person's name might be the answer to the question, for example. And so that's, it was that kind of question that he knew the answer to then, but he didn't know it the next time. And what was the full-scale IQ you came up with in your test? The full-scale IQ I came, that, that he achieved when I tested him was 77. And where would that fall? In terms of yeah, seventy-seven would fall right about here, and that would be considered borderline range. And what about the general ability index when you considered that in your test? Uh, that that was an eighty-one. So my general ability index came out at eighty-one, which is right in here, which is in the, the, the below average, low average, <laughs> below average, not quite borderline zone there. Did you diagnose him with an intellectual disability? No. Why not? Because his scores don't support intellectual disability. Even the IQ of 77 does not support an intellectual disability. It's too high. What other kinds of testing did you do? I did a broad array of neuropsychological testing where I went beyond just the IQ cluster of tests. I had measured um, a broader perspective of his attention, concentration, learning, memory, uh, abstract reasoning, judgment, problem solving. And so uh, can you tell us a little bit about what those tests tell you about his reasoning and decision-making ability? Yes, I can if I may refer to my notes because uh, I don't want to incorrectly report, report it. Uh, that, that, that testing that I gave was called the Neuropsychological Assessment Battery. Battery is a fancy word for a cluster of tests. Okay, so the NAB for, for ease of use. And there are different modules inside the NAB that measure different things. Did you ask me what the scores were or how we No, no what I'd like you to do is tell us what those tests told you. For example, um, you were here uh, when Dr. Franks told us that his diagnosis meant the defendant would have difficulty with any cognitive decision making or, or reasoning. What, what do those tests you gave show in that regard? 
tests I gave in that regard that measure uh, reasoning and such, um, again, we can slice up reasoning many different ways. Um, there's attention and concentration. Well, there's an attention index. Well, first of all, the overall battery, the nav battery, has a summary indicator that can be used. And that summary indicator there came out at 87. So that would have fall, fallen right about here in the low average range. And then inside the battery, there are modules, five of them. The attention module measures uh, focused attention and speed of mental processing. And that index uh, standard score was 66. Okay. Way down here, that's, that's pretty impaired. But it includes the speed of mental processing uh, and attention. And then, then there's the language index, language skills. Comprehensive language, expressive language, things like that. And his score was 111. Okay, that's up here. So that's clearly a strength for him, is verbal skills, verbal comprehension, verbal understanding, and communicating. Then on the memory index, which measures learning and memory, the ability to retain new information, both visually and verbally, the overall index there was 91 which we can see would be right, right in here somewhere, 91. And the percentile there would have been the 27th percentile, which is an average, uh, uh, low average range. And then spatial index, another module, spatial reasoning, spatial processing, as opposed to language, you know, nonverbal sort of reasoning. Um, that came out at 87, which is in the low average range as well. And then the executive functions, the last module is ex called executive function, which measures um, verbal and nonverbal problem solving, judgment, uh, abstract reasoning, things like that. And his score was 97, with a percentile ranking of 42, which you know is right up here. It's in the average range. You heard Dr. Franks refer to a couple of judgment questions that he asked the defendant. You just mentioned judgment as part of this uh, battery of tests you gave. Is there a specific <coughs> section on that? There is actually. Inside the executive module, there's a subtest called judgment. And it is a verbal reasoning, problem solving type of subtest. And how do you do on that subtest? Uh, let me get the score of that real quick. His judgment score um, came out at the 97th percentile. Um, and actually, with the way these subtests are classified, it's a little different. I need to explain that, okay. if I may. Sure. We talked sure. about IQ scores with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Well, sorry, but the NAB battery. You can be seated. That's I'm sorry. Not that true. <laughs> uh, the NAB battery um, doesn't classify the scores based upon this IQ metric. It uses a different scale called T-scores. And with a T-score, the, the average is 50. Okay. And the standard deviation is 10. Okay, so now, uh, so the mean for a T-score would be right here. But instead of calling it 100, it would call it 50. And this would be 60, 70, and 80, and then this would be 40, 30. So, but it's the same curve. It just has a different scale on it. And so his result on the judgment subtest was a T-score of 69, which is almost two standard deviations above the mean, which would be 1, 2, which is right here. It was better than, and his percentile ranking was 97th percentile. It was better than the judgment of 97% of the average population. I'm going to show you what Marshall State's exhibit 186. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. What is it? This is the actual uh, testing protocol for the judgment subtest. And so does it contain uh, questions and the answers he gave on that? Yes, it's got the questions and my my writing of his answers. Move to admit, State's Exhibit 186. I, 
I just briefly saw it, Judge. I don't know what I need to read it. Well, why don't you take a look at it? the batteries in a smoke detector regularly. His response, so you can rely on the smoke detector when there is a fire. So you don't have to worry about the detector being dead because it could also be you that is dead because of it. Awkward, but it's got the content that is a two-point response. Next question, what should you do if you take too much of a prescription medication? His answer, call Poison Control Center and let them know your situation. It's an immediate response and a two-point response because it's the appropriate thing to do. Number five, why should you not unplug electrical appliances while your hands are wet? His response, because you can get zapped because water is a conductor of electricity and it increases the chance of you getting zapped. Two-point response. Number six, why are certain foods marked with an expiration date? His, his response, so the customer knows when to leave the product with, sorry, my writing's not good. Leave the product with an old expiration to get a product with a newer expiration date so you don't get sick. The concept there is that the expiration date helps inform us as to whether the food might be good or whether we would come ill, which is a two-point response. Um, next one, seven. Why is it important for people to brush their teeth? His response, to keep your teeth as clean as possible and to keep your gums as healthy as possible. That answer addressed two issues, hygiene and uh, keeping away disease uh, and freshness of breath type issues, so it's a two-point response. Uh, number eight, why is it important to tell your doctor all the medications that you are taking? His response. You should tell your doctor because there could be serious side effects that would cause serious life changes and he could give you an alternative route or medication that could improve your condition. Again, two point response. Number nine, why should you wash your hands before eating? This response. Because it is good hygiene and it keeps you from spreading any diseases onto the food. It addresses not only the hygiene issue, but also the transfer of germs. Two-point response. Number 10, the last one. What does it mean when your doctor says that there is a 25% chance of having serious side effects from a treatment? 
his response. Um, I'm sorry, I can't read the first word that I wrote. You should put that 25% chance into perspective of whether or not that medication is good for you over another medication. It means it has a 25% chance of having life-changing side effects. That's not a perfect answer. It's a one-point answer. It's a splitting the difference answer. One point rather than two or zero. Did you find the defendant to be intellectually impaired? I did not. Why not? All of his scores, uh, even his historical IQ scores, uh, some of them are low, yes. But even going back to his childhood scores in the record, none of them fell in the range of intellectual disability. The fact is, the objective data does not support intellectual impairment. Mr. Godejan does not have intellectual disability. We've spoken briefly about how it's common for um, individuals who are on the autism spectrum to have those higher scores in the reasoning part of the IQ test, but the lower scores in the processing speed. Are you familiar with any studies that, that have looked at the autism population with regard to their intuitive versus methodical decision making? Yes, actually there is uh, research you combine, well, you combine speed of mental processing in with methodical, which goes together because when somebody's methodical about their decision making, the speed of mental processing slows. And there's two papers that come to mind, both of them published in the Journal of Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. Uh, one showing that on IQ tests, the speed of mental processing is very low, and so it's telling you do not use the regular IQ score because you should, you, because it gives you wrong results because of that. The other paper, I think it was 2016, uh, would actually measure autism spectrum, the construct, you know, using the same instrument actually that uh, I used and that Dr. Franks used, the autism, the adult autism uh, scale, the autism quotient is a subscale in that, and they gave it to lots of different people and then measured their um, level of autistic thinking using that scale, and also their, uh, their ability to reason and the way they reason with another scale. Now this scale measures um, methodical, deliberate, step-by-step -step type of reasoning, but it also measures intuitive, snap judgment kind of reasoning. They're different. And they found in this research that as the autism uh, as the level of autistic thinking in the person increases, the more they have methodical step-by-step -step thinking and the less they have intuitive snap judgment. It was fascinating research. Does that deal with the, that awkwardness in social uh, settings where if I have autism, I may not know how to react to things that present themselves right to me as opposed to if I have more time to think about it. Um, I can make a better decision. Yes. Yeah, and when there's no time uh, limits, for example, where I'm asking him these questions, I, uh, there was no particular time limit. It wasn't under the gun time limit was. He could think through the, and give me an answer. That's deliberate, methodical type of reasoning, uh, which is very different than an, an, an impulsive, intuitive, i got to have an answer right now. People with autism spectrum traits are not very good at the spontaneous, quick change type decision making. But they're actually reasonably good with methodical step by step thinking. Did you reach a diagnosis with regard to the defendant? Yes, I did. What was it? Uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder, um, mild or level one, I should say. And also, um, because his uh, reading level is not up to what I think it probably should be, and his math skills aren't quite what they ought to be, I diagnosed specific learning disability uh, for reading and specific learning disability for math. 
And does the DSM give us an ex specific examples of what a level one, two, and three could look like? Yes. And would using that assist you in explaining your diagnosis to the jury? Yes, it would. Certainly the level part of it. You recognize it's a level 85? Yes, sir. Is that that um, chart from the DSM that explains the levels? Yes, this is a copy right out of the diagnostic manual that talks about how to rate the severity of autism spectrum disorder. Who did Mitt say to do it 185 as a demonstrative exhibit? Objection. So that's what the chart looks like there, correct? Did you say objection? I said no objection. I'm oh, sorry. I think you said objection. I was waiting. So that's the chart in its entirety, and it's kind of small. And so at the bottom is level one, correct? Yes. And as I look at that, the three levels, all three levels require some support, correct? Yes, because that's the nature of the diagnosis, right? If the person didn't require some level of support, they wouldn't have a diagnosis. They would just be quirky. Okay, that's this group out here that doesn't have impairment at some level and need some support, that would meet the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And the defendant is definitely not level three, correct? Correct. That's the most severe. So if we look at levels one and two, in addition to talking about what the deficits are, it gives us an example, correct? Yes. The severity levels on the left and then the social communication examples are in the middle, and then the restrictive repetitive behavior kind of examples are on the right. So level two is described, for example, as a person who speaks in simple sentences, but whose interaction is limited to narrow special interests. What, is, what does that mean to you, narrow special interests? Well, that's uh, when they do speak in simple sentences, it's almost always on their area of interest. Let's say uh, somebody was really focused on collecting baseball cards. That's their big interest, right? They can talk to you in simple sentences, but it's always going to come back to their baseball cards because that's what they're really, really interested in. So there'll be simple sentences that always slide back into their narrow area of special interest. And what about who has markedly odd nonverbal communication? What does that mean to you? Okay. That's the, the other aspect of their communication. Uh, the nonverbal uh, is, is odd, but it's not just odd, it's markedly odd. Okay, that's the term there. Okay, so it's more than just odd, it's got to be a lot of odd okay, in their nonverbal interaction. Does that describe the defendant? Does this appear? Yeah, that example for number two, level two? I don't think so because person speaks in simple sentences and, and always goes back to their narrow focus of interest, uh, which is not my perspective, Mr. Rodejohn. So with regard to level one, it describes a person who's able to speak in full sentences, engage in communication, but whose to and fro conversation with others fails. What does that part mean, that to or fro conversation with others fails? It's, it's the dynamic of conversation, which we all know is a give and take person speaks a little bit and then they rest and the next person speaks a little bit and it rests and it's a dynamic process and it and we can feel it when it's going right and we're talking with somebody and if somebody doesn't work with you there and it becomes disjointed and awkward it's difficult to communicate with somebody like that and this that's what it's talking about it's engaging in communication whose to and fro conversation fails it disrupts and whose attempts to make friends are odd or typically unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so which of those two more accurately describes the defendant in your opinion? In my professional opinion, the box here example for level one is more accurate reflection of Mr. Gaudrillon based upon the available information I've reviewed and seen. We talked about the history part of the model. Yes. Let's talk about the present part of the model, looking at the testing and diagnosis and, and, and interaction with the defendant by you. By model, I'm sorry if I may ask, do you mean the model of how to, how to 
determine a mental state in the past? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we've talked about history with regard to that? Yes. And we've talked about the present, which is your evaluation of the defendant, meeting with him, talking to him, testing him. That's correct. And your diagnosis, correct? Yes. yes. Um, which leads to the time of offense part. Um, so in your training and experience, uh, if you're looking at that time before and at the time of the offense, what would be important to look at to determine what a person was thinking at that retrospective time? Well, the model has two columns there. One is self-report. And so it's important for me to talk to the person about their perceptions of what happened and what they were thinking at the time. Um, granted, that self-report, it may be accurate or it may not be accurate. Because I also have to look at this column, which is the other collateral sources of information that relate to that specific period of time. And it may be um, interviews of people that were there. It may be investigated materials. It may be uh, the, the defendant's own writings at the time, maybe a journal or, or uh, uh, letters. Or, or electronic letters, text messages, things like that. But that's that's at the moment in time, and it's objective about their thinking at that time. So I take what the person tells me, I take this other objective information, and I look at that, and how well does it fit? If it fits in the bigger picture, and it all makes sense. And then I can come to a conclusion about um, his mental state at the time, whether there's indication of you know, psychosis or delusions or, or brain injury kind of problems or cognitive problems or what have you. And then once I have these conclusions from past, present, and a specific period of time, say at the time of the alleged offense, once I know all of that, then I can answer the question that the court has asked me to answer. And so would that include looking at things like perhaps a person told a psychologist who asked them what they were thinking at the time? Yes, if it was relatively close to that period of time, yes. Facebook messages a person may have sent leading up to or at the time of the event? Exactly, I would look at that. Web searches someone may have made leading up to or around the time of the event? Yes, that can be informed. Yeah, these are in fact that ask me new questions. Would it be important to look at the kinds of things the person was doing and saying at or near the time of the offense in coming up with that retrospective look? It's not only important, it's absolutely critical. If you don't do that, you won't get a good understanding of it person's thinking was at the time. You'll get maybe what they told you, and you can, as a psychologist, spin a lot of psychological theory about trying to explain that, but if you don't look at this stuff, you're not going to understand what was really going on at the time. Yes, it's vitally important. No further questions? Or express any opinion about the case until it is finally given to you to decide. 
you're not doing any research or investigation on your own about any matter regarding this case or anyone involved with the trial. Do not communicate with others about the case by any means. Do not read, view, or listen to any newspaper, radio, electronic communication from the internet. Until this report of the trial. About five minutes? <laughs> All right, about five minutes. Okay.